My name is Stefan Alexander, and I am the E.E. Just, should be formal, the E.E. Just 1907 Professor of Natural Sciences um, and a faculty in the Physics and Astronomy Department. I first want to say hi to my colleagues in the Physics and Astronomy Department. Thanks for coming out and supporting this. Um, so this is the third year of the E.E. Just Symposium. This is our third year. Um, and I just want to say a few things about the theme for this year. The theme for this year is creativity in the sciences, or STEM, what we now call in this modern coronation. And I just lost my file that I'm supposed to read. So just bear with me for a second. <laughs> the days of me memorizing these things, it's over. Um, and as I'm looking for that, let me first um, look for it because I'm not... <laughs> this will get edited, so... That's where it's at, okay. I'm just looking for the, the file is called Just Speech. There you go. So, the, the um, theme, but the theme extends beyond creativity to something that E.E. E. Just, who graduated from Dartmouth in 1907, engendered, which is creativity, vision, and perseverance. And I really want the students here to listen very carefully to this. Um, and this, these are some quotes from E.E. E. Just. So E.E. E. Just was first and foremost a scientist, beyond just a biologist. So here's a good quote from his textbook, The Biology of the Cell Surface, which was published in 1938. Quote, unquote, living things have material composition are made up finally of units, molecules, atoms, and electrons, and surely as any non-living matter, like all forms in nature, they have chemical structure and physical properties and are physiochemical systems. As such, they obey the laws of physics and chemistry. So one would deny this fact, sorry, would one deny this fact, one would therefore deny the possibility of any scientific investigation of living things. But he went beyond that. He goes on to say, we have often striven to prove life as wholly mechanistic, starting with the hypothesis that organisms are machines, and we overlook the organodynamics of protoplasm, its power to self-organize. So the spirit of e, this, um, this E.E. Just Symposium is for those and by those that are interested in going beyond their, their limited viewpoints in, the, in their science or their discipline, for those and those that approach age-old issues from a fresh perspective. I'm not going to take too much time to talk about E.E. E. Just Perseverance, but to, to say that he went, through, he went through a lot. He graduated Dartmouth Valedictorian, the top of his class. Um, he had a very hard time getting a, you know, a position in the United States. He went to Europe. Um, there's a beautiful book written um, about him by Ken Manon um, called The Black Apollo of Science. Definitely read it. I found out that Michael Peskin already read it. We left a few copies. Um, so I just want to end by just um, um, saying a few words of thanks. Um, those few words. So this marks our third year. And when I first got to Dartmouth, through the generosity of Dean Mastin Duno and Co Coates, I was enabled to do something that I did not have when I was an undergraduate student or a graduate student. You see, even though I am a theoretical physicist, I love learning all forms of science and how they relate to each other. This is what the E.E. E. Just Symposium exemplifies for, for today and the next, the next day of talks. We simply engage some of the world's greatest scientific and innovative minds in informal discussion and debate at the interface of their respective disciplines. In closing, without the years of support from the following people, this event and the E.E. E. Just program, and I would like the E.E. E. Just scholars to just quickly stand up to be acknowledged, all E.E. E. Just scholars. I would like to thank President Hanlon for expanding the E.E. Just program that allowed scholars to have a pre-matriculation, the Dartmouth Adventures in STEM summer program, and research opportunities throughout the year. I would like to, again, thank Dean Massenduno for his continued support and never saying no. I would like to thank Martin Wyborn, um, our Vice Provost for Research, and the Provost Office for consistent financial support for the symposium. I would like to thank my colleagues Craig Sutton, Farron Briggs, and John Cool for teaching and helping me plan the DAS summer program. 
I would like to thank my assistant and EHS coordinator, Maria Topol, for all of the hard work she has put in for the program Seen and Unseen. And most importantly, I would like to thank um, the Dean of Sciences, David Coates, for being my soundboard, constructive critic from day one. This program would have not gotten this far without his commitment and conviction. And on that note, I would like the, um, Dean Coates to come up. Thanks, Stefan, and thanks again for organizing an outstanding symposium. I know we're all looking forward to this uh, impressive and exciting program. My uh, pleasure today is to introduce our keynote speaker, Jim Gates, uh, who's back uh, for a third time, thank you, to open this symposium. And uh, so many of you, of course, are very familiar with Jim, but his accomplishments are so impressive that I thought it's worth reviewing them again. Uh, he did his undergraduate and PhD degrees at MIT, uh, that small technical school down the road in, in, in Boston, Cambridge. And then uh, he did two postdoctoral fellowships, one at Harvard in the Society of Fellows. Uh, as many of you know, of course, Dartmouth has just started a Society of Fellows and will be attracting um, many new postdocs here next year. And then a second postdoc at Caltech. Um, he then is, um, went on to a distinguished career. He's now at the University of Maryland as a Regents Professor uh, there. and. Um, is very active in many, um, many uh, important areas of science. He's on President Obama's Presidential Council of Advisors in Science and Technology, and I understand was called to Washington for some consultation on Ebola this week. Uh, he's had just about every award that one could imagine and hope for, the National Medal of Science most recently. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's been featured on many uh, TV shows, uh, science-oriented TV shows like PBS Nova. And um, um, I, I, I can conclude by, with an exciting announcement, exciting to me anyway, and that is that uh, we are pleased that Jim will be joining us in residence next year, all of next academic year, as the Roth Distinguished Visiting Scholar. So you, you may... <laughs> You may remember Jim Noctway was our first distinguished uh, Roth Distinguished Visiting Scholar last year, and this year we have uh, uh, Steger, Professor Steger in economics uh, is, uh, is our distinguished visitor, and um, then next year uh, Jim will be here. If we can find an office, I hope, um, Jim, <laughs> in Wilder, um, then we'll be very pleased to have him there. With that, Jim, please uh, welcome back. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good evening, good evening, everyone. I assume the uh, microphones are, yeah, I can hear the echo, great. Um, I, uh, it's a very great pleasure, first of all, to be back. Uh, I was uh, telling several people that this, is sort of, this has sort of become part of a routine for me. This is my third year, and so when Stefan initially asked me to come back, I was thinking, you know, they, I should probably not do that. They should invite someone else and uh, hear something new, different and new. And then I started thinking, well, how would I feel if I didn't go back? And then it was a little bit like a homecoming reunion or something. And so if you know what it's like when you have a bunch of friends and then suddenly they're going to be there and you're not going to be there, right? You're going to miss all the big fun. So I decided that I would say yes. And then as a consequence, I uh, got a chance to see new and old friends again. Uh, there's one person uh, this year who's new to the group, but I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about him uh, and embarrass him a little bit. Uh, he's the gentleman sitting third uh, in the front row here. Michael, why don't you stand, please? <laughs> Michael Peskin is one of the, our nation's most distinguished particle theorists. He uh, has a position at SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. But I actually first met Michael in 1977. And we were at Harvard. I was, uh, we were both junior fellows. And uh, there was one other junior fellow. We're not completely sure what happened to that guy. His name is Ed Witten. Uh, so you can see it was, a, it was a tough crowd to be running with, me, Ed, and Michael. And Michael, I hope he won't be too terribly embarrassed, but Michael had a reputation even coming into Harvard. So I had this office mate that this guy was supposed to be so smart that he could get a postdoc in ways that others of us could not possibly dream of. And so I, you know, I sat there for a year. 
And then at some point I realized that, that this guy, even though he's really smart, you could talk to him. Not every smart person can be talked to. <laughs> and uh, the, it was a joy actually to have him as an office mate. I certainly learned things from him and I think he may have learned one or two things from me. You can ask him. And, uh, but the, the funniest thing is to watch Michael during seminars. Some of you, uh, well, we, some, at least one of you has done that because he's laughing. Um, if any of you, well, most of you are too young to remember this, but I see some people who will remember a TV character named Columbo. And Michael, in seminars, acts exactly like Columbo. <laughs> now, if you're some young hotshot physicist, you might not know who Michael is. And you will come in, and you know, all the hotshots are usually sitting in the front of the room. Well, with Michael, he's all often in the back of the room. So you might figure, there's this old guy, he doesn't know very much back there. And then you'll, you'll start talking. And then, at a certain point, Michael will say, well, you know, there's just, this is this one little question I have. And of course, then he begins to decimate your entire logical construct. And so Michael's famous for this, and uh, it's just such a joy to actually be back here uh, in his company again after, geez, it's just been a ridiculously long time. We've seen each other a few times in intervening years, but it was from 1977 to 1979 that we actually shared an office together at Harvard. Okay, so. I see, okay. Uh, as you can see, he still has awesome powers. Um, before I begin, of course, I wanted to thank my host, uh, David, Richard, and I mean, folks that are now sort of friends. Uh, on the occasion of my first speaking here, I talked a little bit about mathematics and the weird kind of mathematics that uh, physicists start to create, and in particular, this. this physicists in particular. And um, so I'm a theoretical physicist, but I always like to introduce myself in several different ways. So one of my introductions is I'm a simple country theoretical physicist. Another is that I am a fallen mathematician. Uh, but I'm someone who has an interesting, I think, way to look at the mathematics that uh, shows up in particle physics. And so rather than talk about my own research tonight, I want to talk about something that excites me because uh, there have been developments in the world of physics that you may have heard about a little bit, and I'm gonna take you sort of a little bit to the edge so that when the big news comes, you can say, yeah, yeah, I know what that means, and then you can go out and impress all your friends. So I have a, I have a theorist's bucket list, and it looks like this. The first item on the bucket list is the Higgs boson. Uh, the second item is gravity waves. The third item is superpartners. And the fourth item is superstring M theory. And what I mean by this bucket list is I would hope to be around long enough so that some kind of experimental or observational basis for supporting these things would be found. Well, as you know, in 2012, the Higgs boson was found. So that's why it's in red here. I can cross this off my bucket list. Gravity waves, well, we're gonna, that's what's going to be part of our story. But Let's talk about the evolution of science a little bit. Um, this, is what the table, this is what the table of elements looked like when Mendeleev initially put it together. And as you can see, it has some holes. Today, the table of elements looks like this. Much larger, much more complete, there are no holes. And it's the lack of holes, by the way, that I want to draw your attention to, because that's actually, uh, that's actually the result of symmetry. If you look at this diagram, it is aesthetically more beautiful for us to look at than its predecessor with all those missing holes. So symmetry turns out to be a terribly important uh, aspect of physics. In fact, there was a wonderful uh, physics colloquium today by visiting Professor Nyer, who's sitting back uh, in the audience, uh, that I had the pleasure to sit through. And he was talking about one of our greatest heroes, Richard Feynman, who I actually knew when I was at Caltech. Uh, maybe I'll tell some personal Feynman stories one day, but the, those days have not come yet. So the standard model, the particles, the tiny things that are inside electron, inside nuclear matter, the quarks, leptons, looks like this, except in 2012, that happened. The Higgs boson was discovered. So one thing, uh, one takeaway from this is that science is dynamic. And that's one thing that people who are not scientists seem to lose sight of. Uh, they, uh, it often seems to be the impression that people think that science is kind of like history. You know. Uh, Columbus sailed the blue in 1492, right? And anytime you say that, if you got the date right, you're gonna be right, 
And all you have to do is just memorize a bunch of dates. But it turns out there's a lot more to history than, than memorizing dates. Is, are there any historians in the audience? Uh, at least one. And so some of you might think that all there is to history is memorizing dates. But in fact, that is not all there is to history. The more interesting part of history for those of us who even are amateurs at it is that you come to understand that there's a kind of subtlety at work in history. Although you can line up the dates of events, causation and connectivity of these events is often not as clear as you think. And in fact, that's where historians actually bring great value to the telling of the human story. I know this because I'm an amateur historian. In fact, it was mentioned that I was uh, at Harvard. I, got, I sort of got that appointment because I started talking about history during my interview. At least I'm convinced that history got me that appointment. So I have had a long-term interest in history going back a long way. So this is what the standard model looks like today if you put it along a certain axis. And I ask you, well, is that very symmetrical? Does that, I mean, does that look balanced to you? I sure hope you would say no. Because you see, in 1975 or 76 or so, I was a graduate student at MIT. And I was trying to figure out how, how I was going to build a successful career in theoretical physics. And you see, for you young people out there, um, you're going to face the same challenge. As science, or in general, as academic disciplines progress in time, new ideas suddenly occur. And one of the interesting things about these new ideas is if you're a young person, you are expected to compete against colleagues who have had 5, 10, 15, 20 years of experience doing this thing that you want to do. Does that sound like a fair race to you? It sure did not to me. So I decided that uh, I was going to do something different. And I wound up, because of that, working on supersymmetry. I was the only person at MIT who thought the idea would be interesting. And so I wrote the, the, first, uh, the first thesis. But the thing that really got me about supersymmetry was the idea that there are new forms of matter and energy that I had not learned about before in class. So for young people, that means be willing to take a chance on some new ideas with your own intuition, because that's how innovation comes about. But the other thing that was interesting was I immediately got a sense that the universe, instead of looking like this, might look like that. And as once again, you can see, it's a much more balanced view of how the universe might be put together. So I'm not going to talk about these things. This is part of my personal history. But it does give us something about science. I want to talk about something else that I'm fascinated with. Item number two on my bucket list, gravity waves. Have you ever heard of waves of gravity? Some of you saying yes. I bet for most of it, the answer is no. You've never seen gravity do the wave, right? You've seen people in studio in the stadium do the wave, but not gravity. So what is a gravity wave? That's what we want to visit tonight. Well, first of all, we live in a universe that's very interesting, uh, partly because you're all here. That's one of the reasons why it's very interesting. And the fact that it, it, we live in a universe that allows you to exist is a very interesting fact for those of us who try to figure out how the universe is put together. In 1965, a very a story started. Namely, uh, some gentlemen were able to detect microwave radiation coming from the sky. Their names were Arno and Penzias, and this won them a Nobel Prize. The picture you see there is the device called the Homedale Horn, which they used to actually detect this microwave radiation. And this microwave radiation, we've been looking with more and more specificity and accuracy over the years, so that by 2003, uh, we had a satellite called WMAP. And we've even gone beyond WMAP. But you can see more and more details are emerging in this picture. This object is a fossil. It is the reason, uh, one of the strongest reasons that physicists will tell you that we know with as much certainty as a scientist can know anything that the universe began 13.8 billion years ago. It's just like if you walk into a museum and you see a, a dinosaur fossil, no one can tell you that thing didn't exist, right? In the same kind of way, because we know how to see this object, we cannot be told that our universe looks different, because this is the only way for us to understand what this object is and how it got there in the sky all around us. So Planck in 2014 is our latest evolution. And we have begun to put together a cosmic history, which you can hear about in other talks. We think we can tell you things about the evolution of the universe that goes back to this 13.8 billion years ago. There was this wonderful time, which you might think of as the first morning. You see, our universe was born, we think, in this cosmic thing called the Black, I'm sorry, the Big Bang, and then expanded outward. At a certain point, the expansion became sufficient so that light could travel through it. Before that point, light was bound. 
And so when you get the point where light can travel through it, you have a first morning. That first morning is what you're looking at. We live in a universe that's sufficiently clever that it took its snapshot at about 380,000 years after its birth, and that's what this picture is. So, you know, pictures are pretty, and I promise not to do this too often, so don't start running away yet, but we're going to do some of this math stuff. Mathematics turns out to be the only human language that has enough precision that it allows us humans to tell the story of the cosmos and to be able to make predictions. Most people don't know that mathematics is, is a language. Most people think it's a terrible thing that's done to them in school. <laughs> but it's a language. And it has some very interesting and peculiar attributes about it. It's the most telepathic of human languages that there is. If two people are talking about mathematics, you can know the precision of thought of the other person greater than any other language that we use as humans. So it's telepathic to a startling degree. There are other attributes, but since I'm not here to talk about mathematics tonight, I'm going to cut it there. But we're going to do a little bit of mathematics. So you're listening to me. You're hearing sound. In terms of people like me, I can write an equation that describes that sound. And that's actually what I've done here. I've written a, this, uh, this thing on the top, which involves trigonometry. It's a description of what's called a pressure wave of sound that you hear as it leaves my larynx and gets to your ears. Now, this, this particular mathematical expression was actually known back in the 1800s. And uh, we physicists have been basically elaborating these kinds of equations ever since. Let me try to show you this, uh, this particular sound wave with another illustration. Because, well, not everybody likes mathematics. In fact, I think most people don't like mathematics. So I always like to say what you need to understand about mathematics, and especially theoretical physicists, is that we're just like novelists. I bet you all know what novelists do. A novelist takes words, punctuations, sentences, paragraphs, and tells stories. A theoretical physicist is someone who takes mathematics and tells stories. And the stories that we are talking about are the most accurate human description of nature. So that thing that I just showed you, that, that piece of mathematics, I can show it to you, and I'm going to do that right now. Here is a picture of a bunch of soldiers marching. And you see how they're marching forward and they're they are bunched together? That expression that I showed you in the previous transparency is describing this. This is what's called a longitudinal wave to us who know the mathematical sciences. These are, if you replace these soldiers by little air molecules, that's why you can hear me. Because those air molecules are marching towards your ears step by step and impinging on your eardrums, causing electrical signal that you convert into sound. So that's what that piece of mathematics was doing. Now, so when you start talking about physical attributes, you can sort of see that there's a very interesting way that you can proceed here. You can look and do experiments and then ask yourself, what is the mathematics that describes the things that I see around me? And that's what people like me do. So let's, uh, let's first of all, talk about one of, the, one of the real magicians in the history of my discipline. Most of you have never heard of him. I'm going to, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to call him the, Mag the Magister of, C of Celeritas. Most of you will say, gee, well, what in the world is that all about? If you know some Greek, you might remember Celeritas is the Greek translation for speed or swift or fast. And so Magister is a magician. So this is somehow a magician of speed. What is the ultimate speed in the universe? The speed of light. And so, in fact, I'm referring to this gentleman. James Clark Maxwell, one of the three greatest physicists who has ever lived. And of the three great physicists, Newton, Maxwell, and Einstein, he's the one that most people have never heard of. And yet, he's the one most responsible for us walking around with things like this. Well, actually not this one, because this is a Generation Two Blackberry. <laughs> and I have to tell you that I, a, a few years ago, I met the uh, CEO of Research in Motion, and he saw my phone, and he said, you know, Jim, we can replace that. <laughs> But as you can see, I still have old trusty on my head. So Maxwell wrote these equations. And those equations talk about everything that has ever been described in terms of electricity and magnetism. And it also told a secret that no one had ever quite figured out beforehand. So here are the equations. And it's, you know, it's typical math. So, what's the, so when you talk to the scientists about mathematics, you also always should be asking, what's the story you're trying to tell? What's the story behind the piece of mathematics that you're after? And so what Maxwell's story was is that when you have a charged object like an electron, it has a form of invisible hair attached to it 
that we physicists call the electrical field. And furthermore, not only is this invisible hair there, it affects you. If you can imagine that there's a, an electron at the middle of this and take it with your hand and shake it, you might imagine something happens to the hair. And in fact, Maxwell was the first person to work it out, that if you shake that electron in the middle, the hair starts to wave. And the propagation of these signals move away from the location of the electron. Well, gee, that's a useful thing to know, because if you believe that, then you might say, well, let me go out and measure that piece of mathematics. And if you found that it was an accurate description, you might have another idea. Maybe I could use these moving waves to carry messages. In fact, a guy named Marconi kind of figured that out. That's what radio is all about, using these electromagnetic waves to carry signals. And in fact, all of our modern communication technology, Wi-Fi, radio waves, all of it can be traced back to Maxwell's equations and the fact that these waves, when you take a charged object, generate waves in this invisible hair that move away from its location. These waves, by the way, are useful to you in another way because that, they are what you are actually using to see me. You see, the electromagnetic waves, the little packets of them, the quanta of them are particles of light which are generated in sources like this. They bounce off me, proceed to your eye, cause a chemical reaction which you then translate into vision. And so these waves are extremely important for us. We, we've been interacting th with them ever since we became a species able to view the world in a visual manner. But we didn't know that you could actually create new ones by shaking charges. That's the new story from Maxwell. These waves have other properties. So in this picture, uh, you can see the wave that's being shaken back here, but you'll notice it's winding around this sort of clock face in an anti-clockwise manner. That's what we physicists call polarization. It turns out that light is not just like the soldiers. It has this winding motion attached to it. Helicity, we sometimes refer to it. That was right-handed helicity I just showed you. This is left-handed helicity. As you can see, the wave is now winding around the opposite sense as I separate out its circular component. So this is the notion of polarization. Now, this is actually in Maxwell's equations. You can actually study the equations and extract that this winding property sits there in the equations. But most of you experience polarization in a slightly different way because you probably have worn polarized glasses. And the way that polarized glasses work is that they're actually sensitive to these two different kinds of light. And actually, when you're looking at a surface like a, a, a surface of water, it turns out you can shield out some of the polarization by having special materials that are sensitive to polarization. That's what polarization is all about. Now, remember the attributes we talked about. Light can move away from its source. You shake it, it moves away. It moves away in a wave-like manner. You can also ask what the height of the wave is. That's, and for light, we would, uh, and we would translate that as brightness or intensity. How big the wave is is how bright we see it when it hits our eye. And then finally, there's this attribute of polarization. Most of us cannot see polarization without something like polarized glasses. But in fact, there are a few individuals who can actually see polarization with their eyes. This was discovered in the 1870s by a geologist named Heidinger. And this effect is called Heidinger's brush, that there are people who are sensitive to polarization with no sort of apparatus at all. That's, that person is extremely rare in our species, but they actually exist. So move away in the, uh, into the form of waves. The height of the wave is the intensity. And if it, in certain ways have these winding motions called polarization, these are the facts that I want to impart to you. So we got that lesson number one in radiation. Mathematically, it looks like this. Again, uh, because words are not good enough. Words are never good enough. Why aren't words good enough? Well, I, I try to tell people, you know, if uh, you wanted to build a car, you probably would not, you would probably not like it very much if I hummed you a tune about how to build a car. <laughs> What does that actually mean, right? I mean, do I put two wheels in a car or three wheels? The, word, the point is that humming does not carry the information you need if you're going to do uh, engineering. And that's why we use mathematics, because it's the only human language that carries the necessary information to allow you to build things with precision. That's why it's special among the human languages. We know of no other human language that has this attribute. 
So this is what that wave thing that I showed you looks like as a mathematical formula. Let me point something rather interesting out. Uh, my colleague Michael will tell you, oh yeah, those are, plain mag those are plain electromagnetic waves that Jim wrote, and yes, they are. In the second line, I've done something uh, rather unusual, namely I've used what's called cyl cylindrical coordinates, and then we get these, again, we see these trig functions, but this time there's something in the argument, this thing called phi, which if I go back to the case of the sound wave, in the sound wave, you can see it, it just looked like this. There was no extra piece. <laughs> that extra piece, mathematically, is the winding that I told you about in the picture. So the mathematics knows about that kind of behavior and encodes it in a very subtle way. OK, so once you know about this last representation, you can think of photons in a very different way. You can think about them as a game of rings and stars where these rings are what you can call B modes, and the stars are the E modes. That a mathematical expression I showed you translates as a picture precisely into this object that I've shown you. And this shows you another power of mathematics that is not obvious. Mathematics allows those who use it to look at the universe in ways that you cannot get to by any other means. I like to say mathematics is our third eye, it's the third eye of science. It allows us to see in ways that are just far beyond anything else that I've ever experienced. Okay, so gravity, because the purpose of tonight's talk was supposed to be gravity waves. We've learned a whole lot about waves and, and electromagnetism. What about gravity? This brings me to the second magician of my talk. And you can probably guess who it is. Because the first magician I introduced you to was Maxwell. And I told you that the only other super great physicist that I know about is a guy named Newton. And so the third magician is the other super great physicist I've met in my life, at least figuratively. I have to tell you, I have to be careful when I say things like that. I once was talking to a young reporter and said, I met Einstein first when I was uh, 16 years old in my classroom. And what I meant by that was I met Einstein's equations. <laughs> the young journalist wrote an article says, Jim Gates met Einstein when he was 16 years old. <laughs> Never happened, folks. Never happened. So when I say things like that, it, you have to make sure that you understand I'm taking some poetic license. So, but I did meet Einstein at 16 in the sense that I studied his equations. Remember, I told you the equations are, telep are telepathic. So when you study someone's equation, you can actually start to study things about their minds and the way that their mind works. By the way, you do this with words, too. When you read people's writings, you get an insight into their mind. When you look at a painter's work, you get an insight into how that painter's mind works. But with mathematics, as I said, there's a precision in understanding the thought that is not there in these other media. So the next magician was this guy, Albert Einstein. Uh, this was uh, taken from uh, uh, a the cover of Time magazine when they were trying to figure out who would be the man of the century, 1999. There were a few candidates, and I have, to, uh, I have to admit, it was really easy to guess one of the others, a guy named Adolf Hitler. Because in fact, remember, man of the year is an award not given because you're necessarily a very good person. It's given because you had an enormous impact on the world. And Hitler certainly had an enormous impact on the world. Nonetheless, the editors at Time chose Albert Einstein. And I'm extremely happy that that's the case. First of all, because, you know, I'm a physicist. I like to be associated with other nice people, right? So it's nice to have a physicist chosen as the man of the century by Time magazine. Albert Einstein was an extremely unusual individual. You've probably heard stories about him being terrible at mathematics when he was in school. Those, are not, those stories are not true. By the time he was 15, he had, mastered, uh, he had mastered integral and differential calculus, something most of us don't do until we're in our 20s. So he was not a bad student. But what he was was an unforgiving student. He hated rote learning and memorization, learning by rote. He would rebel at teachers who would say, memorize this because. That was not an argument that he would buy because, because it had always been done this way. If you could give him an argument that would challenge his intellect, he was very good. But if you just did something that was 
you know, because you were doing it by the numbers? And then his response was something that I'm going to paraphrase a, a, a statement I know. So I think his attitude was something that you can pretend to teach and I will pretend to learn. And he didn't learn very much like that. But he was an unusual mind. He also demonstrates something rather interesting about the interaction of, of mathematics with how human creativity, which is actually the subject of this meeting, he demonstrates this by telling you, because Einstein was voluble. He, he spoke. He was a person who did great science, but he was also an observer of himself doing great science. And so if you read his writings, he will tell you what he was thinking about and how he got to certain conclusions. And his first set of discoveries came out in what we call the Year of Miracles, 1905. He wrote four papers that year. Any one of those four papers could have won a Nobel Prize. Only one of them did. And what's interesting is the one that won the Nobel Prize was not the one you might think. Because one of those papers was the invention of special relativity. You know, time and space get mixed up. If you go very fast, time slows down. Fast things shrink, all that magical sounding stuff. That was one of those four papers. But he didn't get the Nobel Prize for that paper. He got the Nobel Prize for um, his work uh, on um, the photoelectric effect, a very practical observation of how devices work. And this is actually something about the character of the Nobel Prize. Nobel Prizes aren't given to people for doing great mathematics. There are other prizes that are given for that. The, the most prominent one is something called the Fields Medal, something that Witten was uh, accorded, uh, became a recipient, and the first non-mathematician to receive the award uh, in around 1983. But in Einstein's telling of his story, he says that all of his progress in physics began when he was 15 years old. Now, at 15, he had learned calculus, but he didn't know enough mathematics to describe electric, electric, electricity and magnetism. But he could ask a very deep question. Imagine you are on a train and you have a mirror. You see yourself in that mirror because the photons bounce off your face into the mirror and then into your eyes. They're moving back and forth. Now let's let the train start to accelerate. Suppose the train is moving at exactly the speed of light then the question becomes, how do the photons that would, were previously bouncing off me getting to the mirror? Because the mirror is also moving at the speed of light. So how do they get there? In other words, if you held that mirror and slowly accelerated the, chain, the train, would you at a certain point disappear? Now, that's the kind of question that a, anyone could ask. Certainly a 15-year-old kid could ask that question. You don't have to know science to ask that question, at least not a lot of science. But he asked it. And he also recognized that any kind of answer that he tried to figure out made no sense to him. So he spent a 10-year-long quest trying to figure out what was the solution to this puzzle. Would I disappear at a certain point? Well, that doesn't seem right. And this was one of the arguments that he used in order to conclude that the speed of light is a constant and what that means is that even if you're moving near the speed of light, let's say close to, the speed of light itself should be moving a little faster so that you don't disappear from the mirror. That's his reasoning. So that's what he concludes. The more remarkable thought he has is that you can use light to measure space and time. That's, a, that's something that people don't often talk about in special relativity. That according to Einstein, light is a ruler that you can measure the behavior of space and time themselves. Very subtle idea. So he invents flexible space-time. That is, that space and time can flex. According to Isaac Newton, that's a crazy idea. Isaac Newton never knew about flexible space-time. That is, according to Isaac Newton, space-time was like this grid that you see in the drawing that I've shown you here. But, and if a, a particle of light is moving, it moves from one location to another on the grid. And according to Newton, if you're at rest, well, yeah, it can move at the speed of light. But what Einstein told us is that space-time itself actually flexes. Now, if you look at this flexing picture I'll show you, I show you, there's one thing about it that actually does not change. 
And this is, in physics is, and mathematics is what we call an invariant quantity, something that does not change no matter what conditions you examine it under. The thing that does not change in this picture is the slanting slope of those lines. Those are fixed as we flex space and time. That slope of the line is the speed of light. And according to Einstein, no matter what you do, no matter how you move, that slope will always be the same. Now, of course, I've given you the story in terms of words. That's not the way he told the story. He did that. He wrote a bunch of equations. And what I have just told you is the story behind the equations. But he didn't actually write them in this form. I wrote, this is actually the simplest way that I can write them, or one of the simplest ways is I chose this. It involves math again, right? It's like you can't get away from mathematics if you're going to talk about the way fundamental physics works. And in particular here, there's something called hyperbolic trigonometry that maybe a few of you have bumped into in your life. But hyperbolic trigonometry is what underlies the theory of special relativity. Well, now we have space kind of flexing. It's more, instead of being like a rigid grid, it's more like the springs in their box mattress on your bed. They can flex and move apart. That's what Einstein teaches us space and time is like, not like a fixed grid. Well, you know, if you jumped into your bed really quickly, what would happen to those springs? They, they probably would generate some kind of disturbance that might move a little bit away from you. For example, if you were laying in a bed and some person jumped into the bed next to you, you would feel a, a force sort of pushing to the side. And so that interaction of the person with the springs was transmitted from the person to the springs and then the springs to you. Now this is actually the solution to a very deep puzzle. Isaac Newton, I named as the first magician, told us F is equal to MA, taught us about gravity, taught us why the planets sort circle the sun. But if you actually studied some science, and I suspect most of you have, in your science class, your teacher told you that the force of gravity goes like the mass, the product of the mass of the planets is by the square, by the inverse square of the distance, times some number called g. But if you think about what that equation says, and in fact, Newton thought about it, because Newton actually, though he wrote the equation, he did not like the equation. Yet, that's the equation that we used to get from Earth to Moon in the 1960s. Why didn't he like it? Because Newton was also a very deep thinker. And he recognized that what the equation said is that if you have a planet one place and another planet, planetary body elsewhere, according to this equation, something magically reaches out from this place to that and causes the attraction. But <laughs> we've never detected magic in the universe. And so Newton was sensitive to this point, is that magic does not seem to exist in our universe, at least not at this level. And so though he wrote the equation, he was very much aware of its philosophical drawbacks. It's what we call action at a distance. He talks about the difficulties that a deep thinker will come to in thinking about action at a distance. But you see, Einstein solves that problem. Because you see, in Einstein's point of view, once you know about this rippling space-time, you can do something else. So how do you get to rip rippling space-time? Well, well, you know, Einstein, smart guy, so he sits around, effectively, uh, he starts thinking about, well, suppose I was an ant on different surfaces trying to do geometry. Now, this isn't what he did, but this is equivalent to his thought processes. I could do geometry on a cone. The rules of geometry would be different. I could do geometry on the surface of a cylinder. If you actually try to draw little squares and circles and measure angles, you'll find the rules are different. You could be on a sphere and try to do geometry. Again, the rules will be different yet again. Now, or you could do a donut. And then yet again, a different set of rules govern geometry. Now, most people, again, in your experience, someone in your background took you in a class called geometry, and they made you do these geometric proofs with alternate interior angles and 360 degrees and 180, you know, all these things that you memorized. And so you might have thought, that those set of rules that you were given define geometry? The answer is they do, but only in a universe that's completely flat. So the geometry that you learn in high school is the geometry of the infinite flat plane. It's not geometry in general. And so geometry has rules that change. This was a discovery 
that Einstein didn't actually make. About 50 years before Einstein, I'll come back to this, four mathematicians actually figured this out, that geometry has rules that are flexible. And of course, this is very good for Einstein's point of view about flexible space-time, because if geometry is flexible, then maybe his flexible space-time has a place to fit inside of this notion. And in fact, so what Einstein teaches us is that when you talk about gravity, what really happens is that a planetary body like the Earth actually moves along an energy surface created by the sun, and it's the interaction of that surface with the Earth that is what we call gravity. And so there's no magical reaching out of the sun to the Earth. The sun influences space and time to cause them to flex. The Earth moves along this flexible surface, just like you might be in a bed with someone laying next to you, and that's what causes motion of a gravitational free fall. That's Einstein's explanation. He solves the puzzle that Newton knew was there 100, over 100 years earlier. So these are the people who set the mathematics up. When Einstein started thinking about this, he didn't know this mathematics. Einstein was a brilliant man, a genius, but he didn't know everything. In fact, he had a friend named Peter Minkowski who actually taught him this mathematics. And once he had mastered it, the magic of Einstein was, so these mathematicians have been doing this stuff for about 50 years over here. Einstein has these ideas about flexible space-time. He then says, these two things are not separate and can be combined, and the combination is what we call the general theory of relativity. So one of those mathematicians is a gentleman named Bernard Riemann. And he, in some sense, wrote the most elegant description of combining the rules for geometry. So he invented something called, we now call the Riemann curvature tensor. And so Einstein, being the good thief that he is, learned the mathematics and said this, is, said, this thing is not just a piece of mathematics. This thing describes the universe in which we live. That's Einstein's genius at work. Taking a pre-existing piece of mathematics, something that's about 50 years old, very few mathematicians knew the existence of this piece of work. Einstein takes it and says, it applies to us. And then he starts to use it to make predictions. Remember, in the earlier part of my story, I told you Maxwell's equation said if you take a charge and shake it, you generate these waves. Once you have a new mathematical idea, you can begin to play with it and say, hmm, what can I get these equations to tell me that no one has ever seen before? One of the things that Einstein uh, enunciated from the equations was that gravity bends light. Very strange thought. Gravity bends the path of light. Something that you might not ever get to if you only learn Newton's physics. So it's all math, so I'm just going to show it to you. If you don't like it, cover your eyes for a few seconds and we'll, we'll, we'll get rid of it. So these are the kinds of things he did. He, he invented things like the Riemann, he, he used the math and Riemann curvature tensor, and then finally he wrote an equation. Because I like to tell people we physicists are part of a company called Equations Are Us. Because what we do is we write equations. And the equations, when we get really good at writing our equations, they make predictions about things nobody had ever thought about before. Just like Maxwell made the prediction that moving charges generate these ways that we turn into Wi-Fi. So Einstein wrote his equations. This is it. I'm showing it to you. But when he first wrote it, he, didn't, he did not include this term. That's called the cosmological constant. He wrote the other terms. And the reason he introduced this constant was because Einstein, although Einstein was a rebel, this is the one time I can identify in Einstein's career where he yielded to authority. You see, when he wrote these equations, all the great astronomers in the, universe, in the world said the universe was static and fixed. When you write these equations without that term, they do not describe a universe that's static and fixed. And so he introduced the term into the equation in order to describe a static and fixed universe. Now, I'd like to say that proves that Einstein is at least as smart as a lot of our undergraduates. Because if you've ever taught an experimental course in physics to undergraduate students, you give them a lab book, they all go off and they do an experiment, they give you back data. Many times, if you analyze what they did, they all get the right answer because they kind of know what the answer is supposed to be. But the challenge is to use the data to actually prove they got the right answer. And so if you look very carefully in lots of lab books, 
You can find out our students learn an extremely sophisticated piece of mathematics that I like to call the fudge factor. And that's what Einstein did here. He just put a fudge factor in the equation because he knew what the answer was supposed to be because the experts were telling him what the answer was supposed to be. A few years later, Hubble came along and Hummerson and other such astronomers and cosmologists and said, no, no, the universe is actually expanding. At that point, Einstein erased this term and called it his biggest blunder. Now, what's really interesting is that as we look back on this history, now we actually think the term is there. So he put this term in that was, he put it there for one reason. Uh, the universe is expanding, this says that reason goes away. But about 15 years ago, we found out our universe is speeding up in its expansion. And the simplest way to do that is to put the term back in the equations, but put it in with the sign that's opposite to the one that Einstein wanted. So even his mistakes are great. So this brings me to that equation. That equation that I showed you says that space and time actually can support waves, just like the mattress on your bed can support waves, or just like water can support waves. That equation says gravity can, is capable of producing waves. Now, we've never seen these things. So the challenge is to see them. And just like um, other forms of wave, you get frequency. So you know, I can talk like this, or I can talk like this. You can change the frequency of sound. And for light, the analog of frequency is color. Blue is at one end of the frequency, red is at the other. So you can change the frequency of waves. So gravity waves come in different frequencies, caused by different events. So the analog of blue, I'm sorry, of red, would be the waves of gravity that were caused around the time of the Big Bang. Now, can we see those? That's a question. Or you can, be, uh, you can consider supermassive black holes. There are these things called black holes that are predicted by the physics. You could imagine looking at supermassive black holes as they interact with uh, galactic nuclei. Can you detect those kinds of waves? The frequencies are going to be different. Or you could look at uh, things like um, binary stars in our galaxies. And so there's a whole range of frequencies in which these waves can occur. The question is, can we find them? And that's what I'm going to close on. Well, first of all, it's more math, right? Because that's what math, Einstein actually gave us, a piece of mathematics. And it's those of us who like to play with mathematics beat the math to death to get it to tell us a story. And then we go tell, talk to our friends who are very clever at measuring things, because typically those of us who are really good at math are terrible at measuring. It's almost an exclusion principle. And so you have to talk to people who are really good at measuring things. And your friends who are really good at measuring things go out and build these very sophisticated devices. Although the LHC, which measures the Higgs, was not invented for measuring gravity, it's one of the most complicated devices that has ever been constructed. So you talk to people who can build complicated devices. And like I said, normally the people who understand the math are not the people who can build the devices. And, it's and there's a third group that's sort of in between the two. In our community, we call them phenomenologists. So the people who understand the math, they understand devices, they kind of act as the glue to make sure that the whole, the whole of, um, edifice works to discover new science. So this is what the math of these waves look like. It's this last thing. Let me point out, there's a factor of two here. Whereas when I looked at electromagnetic waves, there was a factor of one. And when I looked at sound waves, there was no term like this at all. This is, again, telling us we can track the spin of these waves by looking at the trigonometric dependence on a certain variable. So in March of this year, there was an announcement. The announcement was that an experiment called BICEP2 had seen evidence of gravity waves in the early universe. So how do we translate that to ordinary people speak? Because we're all ordinary people here. So the idea is, if I had a cup of uh, latte, and I put a spoon in it, and I stir the cup up, if I look at the suds and foam on the top of the latte, I can see the pattern there. And so the idea here was that in the early universe, remember in our radiation picture, we always saw these modes that were looking like circles? If they were there in the early universe, they would have stirred the early universe. And therefore, any picture taken of the early universe would show the evidence of this stirring. And that's what the BICEP2 experiment was claiming, that they could see the evidence 
of the gravitational waves stirring the early universe by looking at the cosmic microwave background. That's what was up. Now, unfortunately, we now think that, that was wrong. And I wish David Spurgle was here because this is really in David's realm. David was here last year, and in fact, he and I talked a, a bit about various things related to this. But there's lots of evidence that they blew it. Because we humans aren't perfect. We cannot do everything perfectly all the time. It's just not in our human capacity to do. So in science, we try to do the best we can. And as we tell you scientific stories, they're the best possible things we can tell you at the time. So BICEP2 didn't seem to find this effect. But there's another experiment called Polar Bear where they may be seeing this effect. There's a recent piece of research out that maybe they're seeing the stirring in the cosmic microwave background caused by these primordial, primordial gravity waves. So these are some pictures of the actual, this is the BICEP2 experiment. This picture is an illustration of the Polar Bear experiment. What other ways could you see these waves? Well, I have a little movie here. In this movie, uh, what, we have, what we imagine are two stars, but not two ordinary stars, but two massive neutron stars that are orbiting about each other. Now, neutron stars are very interesting because they have these beam-like structures that come out top. If they're massive enough, they will generate waves of gravity. And if you, unfortunately, the lights are too high, but you can kind of see there's some kind of something here that's rolling. And it's coming to like a familiar blue marble and its companion, namely us, passing the moon. And when this wave gets to the ground, if it's really there, it's going to do something. Now, if it happened to hit at two places on, uh, in the United States, one in the Hanford, uh, old Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington or near Louisiana, uh, uh, New Orleans, it'll come down and find an L-shaped building. This L-shaped building is a scientific experiment called LIGO. The Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory. All of you who are taxpayers in this room, you spent probably by now about $500 million on this. So you might want to know where some of your money went. This is where you were spending it. Actual pictures of LIGO look like this. On the left of this, we have the site in, uh, in uh, Johnson Parish in Louisiana, north. and west of uh, New Orleans. On the right, we have the one in the uh, state of Washington at the old Hanford Nuclear Reservation. As you can see, it's a big L-shaped building. And if you watch the end of my movie, what you would have noticed is that the building was not at rest. It was actually flexing. And the reason that it was flexing is because these waves from the neutron star, if the mathematics is right, tells us that space is flexing. But if something is in space, then that thing has to flex. And so the idea with this experiment is that you can measure the flexing in this L-shaped building, 1.7 long, kilometer long arms. You can try to measure how the arms are stretching when one of these waves comes down and strikes it. Now, the changes that you're trying to measure are remarkable. They're like, ten, they're like a, thousand times the sm a thousand times smaller than the nucleus of a helium atom. <laughs> That's pretty small. And so LIGO has been in operation. It's just recently had an upgrade that will allow it to continue to run. And we're looking for the effect of these waves. So the waves will be changing the lengths of these arms. We use lasers, by the way, to measure the lengths. That's why it's Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory. And we're looking to see, does the, do these two arms get a little bit shorter and smaller in a way that's consistent with this mathematics? That's a hard experiment, clearly. Some people have the bright idea of doing the experiment in space. Instead of, now LIGO actually exists, and in fact, devices like, like LIGO are already in existence on Earth and have been in operation for several years now. But you could imagine doing the same thing in space by putting three satellites, which I have here illustrated in the cartoon. This is what an experiment that at one point was called LISA. And the idea was that you put three satellites in orbit, not around the Earth, but, but around the sun trailing us. And you put them in a triangle shape, and you use lasers to measure the distances between them. And then once again, if one of these gravity waves comes, it'll change the distance, and you will see it again from laser interferometry. Now this experiment, I'm not sure what its current state is. At one point, it had evolved into something called ELISA. And I'm not sure whether ELISA is still on the board. There are probably people here who know more about this than I. 
But this is what your species is thinking about doing. And then the final way to, uh, I'm sorry, second, the next way to, uh, now both those were the same, namely you're using lasers to measure the changes in lengths. There's another, to me, beautiful way to think about this. A moment ago, I showed you that, uh, and again, the lights are too high in here, so you can barely see it in the lighting, but in here there's an illustration, a uh, cartoon-type illustration of a gravity wave, and when it passes between you and a star, you see the star twinkles. So another way to think about measuring gravity waves is to look at objects in the sky that are like clocks. You're saying, wait, 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 wait a minute, what kind of clock do you have in the sky? These things called pulsars. These neutron stars that rotate very, very fast are like regular clocks. And so what you can do is to look at a couple of these things, not just one. Let's say we look at one of the north, straight up, and then one sort of westward. And then we, me we measure carefully their rotation rates. What would happen if a gravity wave passes between us and them? Just like in our cartoon, you would see a changing in the timing of the rotation of the pulsars. Now this method is called the Downing, uh, the Downs, the Helling's Down pulsar timing method. Ah, someone's thank you so much. So as you can see very clearly now, when the gravity wave is between us and something distant, the distant objects seem to twinkle. And so by this means, we have a second way to measure gravity waves. And in this way, we're not measuring the gravity waves caused by these stars, but by gravity waves that will be coming from other sources. And we'll do it by watching a twinkling. We can do this with radio telescopes, by the way, because uh, neutron stars don't, don't always, uh, in fact, almost never are actually in the visible. And here's the idea that you, you look at distant pulsars using theirs like clocks, and then when a gravity wave is in your vicinity, it will change the rate at which you perceive the signals of the uh, clocks, and it changes it in a very predictable way. This is a so-called Helling's down curve. And it, so what you can do is say, I'm going to look at one star directly overhead, and then instead of looking, I can then do measurements as, I, as I'm rotating my arm, I'm looking at stars at different angular rates. And then I compare the twinkling, the rates at which the twinkling occur, as I change this observation angle. And if it falls on that curve that you see behind me, we know that we were hit by gravity waves. And now the final way to detect gravity waves is, in fact, the oldest. I'm at the University of Maryland. And one of my colleagues was Joe, was Joe Weber. Joe is unfortunately deceased now. But back in uh, the 70s, he built this big, well, you can see it right there, this big bar. This thing is called a Weber bar. And the whole purpose of this was, in fact, to detect gravity waves. The idea was that you put sound into this object at a particular frequency. So you put it in a generator, then you listen for it at that frequency. If a gravity wave encounters this device, it will change the length of the device, thereby changing the frequency that you would have at your detector, because you're still feeding in the sound, same sound wave. You get a different sound wave. You say, aha, gravity wave just passed. Now, in 1981 or so, Joe claimed he actually saw one of these things. But no one has ever been able to verify that. Now, did he see it or didn't he? Well, we don't know. At the time, there was severe criticism. But more recently, people have reanalyzed what was going on, and it's not so clear anymore. This also should tell you about science. In science, things can happen that, that we can tell you didn't happen. What do I mean by that? Well, you see, in science, in order for us to know something, it has to be reproducible. And so if you tell me there's an event that happens just once, I have no scientific way to verify that. So effectively, such events are invisible to science. And so this teaches us something very special about the limits of science. And particularly for people who have issues with faith, this is a very important attribute to know about. I could tell another story about that some other time. Just recently, this idea of the resonant cavity has been resurrected yet again, but through a very interesting device, which is actually a quantum device. Rather than building this big cavity 
that Joe Weber was building, it has been proposed within the last month or so that you can work with what are called SQUID, superconducting electronic devices, that you can set up as resonant cavities. So here's a, here is a picture of how one would build such a device. This ruler is to scale here. So you can see this, is, this length here is one centimeter in length. And so the idea is exactly like the old idea of the Weber bar. Namely, you, you put a sound in, you detect the sound, and if the frequency changes, you can say a gravity wave pass, assuming, and here comes the big assumption, that you can isolate all the other sources of vibration that might be around. This is always a problem with gravity wave detection, that you have to be able to isolate all the possible sources of vibration. But if you're really good at that, this is an updated version of the old Weber bar that you might, in fact, think about using to detect gravity waves. I'm done. <laughs> For acknowledgments, a lot of my animations are in a commercial product, which you're seeing up behind you. I, they actually own the IP rights to this, so I have to sort of acknowledge their rights. I am the creator of this thing, but, and I can use these things, but I have to give them ownership props or whatever. Uh, also in involved in this was a gentleman by the name of Ken Griggs in these illustrations. And the animations you saw, I didn't do any of those. I don't even begin to think that. So I'm ready. If people want to ask questions, I'm ready now. Yes, so we're going to, before we um, answer any questions, there's two quick announcements. First of all, we have a day um, full of excellent talks from um, um, our distinguished uh, visitors. Can you all um, please stand up for a quick second to be acknowledged? symposium, if I know how to spell. And I actually want to give some special thanks to uh, my good friend, um, Everett Findlay back here, please send me, who um, designed our new website. And we want to say, we hope to see you guys tomorrow, and now it's time for some hard questions with um, Professor Gates. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for the question. So probably some of you have seen this television show called Big Bang Theory. You would love that. Yeah. I've never seen it. <laughs> Literally, I have never seen this show. And so you know, there are these impressions about what people with these sorts of skill sets wind up doing. But the reality that I have seen in my life is that, well, first of all, physicists are people too. Mathematicians are also people although maybe less so. Um, <laughs> no, that was a joke. No, please, don't, please don't take that seriously. And so it means that at the end of the day, these people with this kind of talent, it's kind of like they can do what they wish. Now, a lot of them will want to become scientists, but in recent times, we have seen large numbers of physicists go to Wall Street and become very wealthy. And so that's an alternative outlet for, for this, this skill set, is to go make yourself a lot of money. Um, but the reality is that, so in my graduating class at MIT when I got my PhD, I'll, I'll never forget, one of my office mates, after he got his PhD in theoretical physics, went to uh, film school in Los Angeles and became a director. So he's creative. So he's creative. And in fact, this is a problem that at least I think I have, most people don't think of this as creativity. Th that when you sit down and do math, it's all this like, by the book, by the numbers, wrote, you know, uh, it's always done this way. But the reality is that the creation of new mathematics and new mathematical ideas and, and extensions of our mathematical understanding of the universe 
to me works exactly like creative artist. That is, you have to actually be able to get outside of the box. Now, when I was young, I remember reading a quote from Albert Einstein, which goes that imagination is more important than knowledge. And at the time, I was stunned. Because to me, imagination was the idea that you could write stories or paint or, or make up uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons type things or read comic books or imagine space. To me, that was an act of imagination. Knowledge, on the other hand, was how you built planes and cars and houses. You know, it was practical stuff. And so I couldn't understand for a very long time how it could be that imagination was more important than knowledge. Someplace in my early 30s, well, late 30s or so, I think I finally figured it out. You see, knowledge is finite. It's like a ball. It has a finite size. And yet, in the future, our species are going to have more knowledge then than we have now. So how does that transition actually occur? Well, if you go right to the surface of the ball, there are people who create knowledge. And how do they do it? They make it up. Just like artists make it up. Now, we are constrained. Because we, you know Michael can make up any crazy idea he wants, but unless it is an accurate description of something that gets supported by nature, it's not going to be acceptable to the scientific body. And so we, most of the times when we make up ideas, they're wrong. But when we get it right, it's fantastic. Yes, sir. Um, in your opinion, would you say that mathematics was invented or discovered? Oh. I mean, I mean, we talk about you know, Maxwell's equations, which model electromagnetism so perfectly, and then we also talk about mathematics as a language, uh, and a human language, which all of others which have been invented. So in your opinion, is it discovered or invented? Thank you for that easy question. <laughs> because I'm going to give you an answer that makes no sense at all. As someone who has made sort of new pieces of mathematics, so there are... So there's this thing called string theory that you've probably heard about. And back in the 80s, a friend of mine named Warren Siegel and I were convinced that we could describe four-dimensional strings by using the principles that lie under the standard model. There are these things called, in fact, it was the subject of Dr. Nyer's talk. In gauge theory, you have these angle-like variables. And in most string theories that people talk about, it's very hard to see these angles. And so Warren and I actually wrote some equations where these angles are present ab initio. Now, we had, in order to do this, we had to actually create a new set of equations that had, I had never seen before. In fact, as far as I can tell, never existed before. But we succeeded in writing these equations eventually because we had a sense that they had to exist. Now, the funny thing about it is when you do this kind of work, it often feels like the mathematics was there before you got to it. But by the same token, you're often confronted with the struggle to create it, so you sort of feel like it's coming from someplace inside of you. And so it feels like both. It's, it's a very strange thing. Questions? Yes, yes sir. So I talked to you about waves of gravity. And in fact, I was essentially using semi-classical language. So if you stop and think about Electron, let's go back. I don't know if you're a physicist or not. Are you? OK, well. Um, so if you, so at, I, I, I began my discussion of radiation by concentrating on electromagnetic radiation, first because that's accessible to a lot of us, because it touches our lives every day. So when you look at electromagnetic radiation, and the equations of Maxwell that I wrote you, those equations do not take into account that the universe is actually quantum mechanical behavior, uh, essentially quantum mechanical in its behavior. So you now have to layer on top of those equations the principles of quantum mechanics. And as I said, uh, Dr. Nair gave a great job talking about that earlier today. But when you layer those principles on, what you find is that there are quanta, there, there are tiny sort of bits of energy that are described by these equations. And if you're talking about electromagnetic waves, those bits of energy have a name. They're called photons. So you simply move this same picture over to gravity. I, I described for you, uh, in fact, I wrote for you a waveform for gravity that was equivalent to a, wave for, a plain uh, waveform for electromagnetic radiation. 
That's a classical set of things that I've done. So now the next stage is I do what's called second quantization, where the bits, the irreducible energy carriers of these waves have to be exposed. Those things are gravitons. That's right. But the gravitons aren't there yet. They're not there yet. But we're going to be really happy if, they, if we, these waves show up. So, 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 well, because Michael is a very, I told you, I began this, <laughs> this presentation by introducing this guy who was my office mate, is a fantastic physicist. So Michael's point, I think, if I may, is the following. I, I didn't say it very well. Yeah. You can say it better. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> so the point is the following. The reason we know about quanta of light is because you can do experiments, something called the photoelectric effect, or another experiment called Compton scattering, and you can actually see the bit like the uh, discrete structure of the energy packets in light actually emerging. And so in order to do that, you have to think of the, roughly speaking, the experimental equivalent of either um, photoelectric effect or quantum scattering, but with gravity waves so that you can see the discreteness. And that's why you can't, that even when we see the waves, we will not have seen the discrete nature of the, of the excitations. Is that acceptable? Ah, uh, that's a very interesting question. Because in, in uh, these, uh, this again uh, goes back to the talk that the early, I heard earlier today. So it turns out that in electromagnetism, uh, the equations are such that when you have these waves, they can actually pass right through each other. If you ignore quantum mechanics, they can pass right through each other through what we call the superposition principle. However, there are waves in nature, and in fact, gravitons are some of them, are parts of these types of waves, where they are in, the equations are actually nonlinear. The things that I showed you are what's called the linearized approximation. If you go back and do it more accurately, these waves actually, when they crash each, into each other, actually have an impact in changing attributes of one another. And so they don't just smoothly f f flow through each other as electromagnetic waves would uh, when you ignore quantum mechanics. Yes. Um, my question is, should the word actually be motion? Because for there to be action, doesn't it have to be consciousness at all? No. We believe, so the way that physicists define action, it's what, so first of all, one of the ways to understand what physics is about is imagine that someone comes into your home when you're not there and turns all the switches off and on, and turns on the air conditioning, and turns on your stove, and writes down a set of rules about how your house works when you're not there. That's what physics is like about the universe. We're not actually talking about, most of the times when we, certainly at the level of the talk here, we're not talking about what humans cause to happen. We're talking about the effects that look like they're intrinsic in the structure of the universe. So you can have, so as far as we can tell, if I, you know, had godlike powers and created a planet over here and created a planet over there and didn't put any uni uh, un humans in the universe, those two planets would still attract to each other. So you don't need con you don't need conscious players to generate action in the sense that physicists use the word. In order to have motion, well, the the. the in this discussion, they're actually tightly linked. The person who really defined motion, motion was actually Sir Isaac Newton. He did this, it's a very funny story. We humans have been, we took about a couple of thousand years to figure out what motion meant. Because the debate really actually, you can go back to Zeno's paradox and the ancient Greeks. And people, you know, some of the best thinkers are trying to figure out, well, what is this thing? You don't really, well, let me say it this way, our species, did not really understand motion until calculus, calculus was invented. That's, in fact, the purpose of differential calculation, calculus, to calculate rates of change. And so I can give you a form of definition, which is motion is what occurs when a change of position is divided by a change of time. That's a formal definition. But in calculus, it's a much more precise statement about the behaviors of functions. Ah, yes. 
Yep. Yep. So is there any uh, theoretical or mathematical safety net that might catch us if we don't find that digital link? Ah. <laughs> well, the universe would certainly be more interesting. If we don't find gravi gravitational waves, it will, I mean, this will be a major problem because it's not just a matter of, of finding gravitational waves. You have to then explain, for example, why does the perihelion of Mercury persist the way it does if Einstein got the wrong answer? Because in fact, that's one of the things Einstein used as an argument for why his theory was an improvement on Newton. You will also have to explain things like, well, what is the source of this object we call the cosmic microwave background? Because if Einstein is wrong, then this thing needs another explanation. See, the point about, about physics, the way that physics use mathematics, is that there are incredible, uh, there are incredible uh, numbers of co what look like coincidences that any successful physics theory has to explain. And if you remove one piece of it, then there's this whole web of, of associated coincidences that you now must explain because you said this central core tenant is wrong. So if we don't find gravity waves, we're going to live in a very interesting universe. For you. <laughs> Uh, let me try to answer. This is a <laughs> this is a serious question. I mean, if I was this young man's age, I would be asking this question. <laughs> In an ideal world, the answer would be yes. There would be more job opportunities. However, we actually live in the real world, not an ideal world. And one of the things. And one of the things that's distressing to people like me, because earlier people asked, what do folks with mathematical ability do? Well, some of us actually do crazy things like advise administrations and school education departments and that sort of thing. Policy formation is called. And one of the things that I have seen very pointedly over the last five years is that the traditional American attitude towards the support of science which has existed since the Second World War, seems to be going, undergoing some sort of evolution. And it's an evolution that, for those of us who are scientists, we worry about very greatly. It is no longer the case that it is obvious to everyone that science benefits our country. And because that's not obvious to everyone, that has financial implications because the kind of science I'm talk I was talking about, that is never supported by corporations. It's supported by the public taxpayer dollars. And so if you cut taxes and continue to cut taxes, you've got to find things to cut. 